Hi everyone. I'm David Davis. I am an adult services librarian at West Hollywood Library. I want to welcome everybody to um, Queer Poetry with Stephen Rains. I've known Stephen since I think about 2016 when he moderated the uh, Lambda Lit Book Club, which is the LGBTQ book club that we hosted here at West Hollywood Library. Um, Anyway, so I actually selected this book in January for LGBT book club and had a great conversation with Stephen Ben, and I'm looking forward to another wonderful conversation with Stephen. For those of you, and thank you, Stephen, for, for joining us tonight. Um, for those of you who haven't read this book, it is a um, like a poetry prose account of what happened in around 1990 when a gay HIV positive dentist in Florida was accused of infecting his patients. I remember this story particularly because the, the main, the first and the main accuser, whose name was Kimberly Bergalitz, was from Tamaquah, Pennsylvania, which is about 45 minutes from where I grew up. So the story really resonated with me. I had, at the time I was um, just starting to come out as a gay man and it just really hit all the um, anxiety notes that I had back then. Homophobia, AIDS phobia, and just general misinformation that was going on at that time. Um, but the thing is, I never found out how the story ended until a close to David. So Stephen was the city of West Hollywood's first poet laureate. And so this just seemed like a good um, fit for Stephen to approach this material. So I was really intrigued by this story and wanted to find out how this story ended. So welcome, Stephen. Thank you for joining us. Um, do you want to start I don't want to put you on the spot, but would you like to start with a couple poems? Sure, and I want to thank you so much for having me here. I'm so excited to talk about queer poetry and specifically uh, the queer poetry that's in this collection. And I think that's a wonderful introduction to the book. Um, you're such a good reader, I appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to read uh, a poem that is a pantoum, which means it has repeating lines. It's a structure of a poem. And the poems in this collection aren't titled. Two years, 10 months, and 29 days, from diagnosis to death, David kept practicing, retired at 40 to die, from diagnosis to death, was scared of small town rumors and small town mentality, retired at 40 to die, he used aliases at doctor's offices hours away from his home, was scared of small town rumors and small town mentality. David said hiding his diagnosis was lonely and isolating. He used aliases at doctor's offices hours away from his home. Kimberly, secretly sexually active, points her finger at David. David said hiding his diagnosis was lonely and isolating. She pointed her finger at him from diagnosis to death was two years, 10 months, and 29 days. So for those of you who are not familiar with this book, it's, a, it's a rendered in mostly poetry. There's some prose. I'll have some questions about that momentarily. But um, I wanted to talk about something that you mentioned in your preface where you you relate a story about how you saw a tabloid TV show and that way back when. Can you tell us about how that story uh, like ignited its spark and led to this book? Yeah, definitely. So in, oh, I'm blanking on the year, but you know, it was, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s was just kind of like the, the popularity of tabloid TV shows, like A Current Affair and Inside Edition. And I was, you know, in the eighth grade at the time. And it was, 
And I, I would come home from school and I would watch those shows specifically because it was the only time I saw queer representation on TV. And even though it was lurid and they had such ridiculous programming like BMW car salesman by day, stripper at night. Like for me, it was so exciting, like, wow, um, just to see gay people. And it was on a current affair or inside edition that I saw the story of Kimberly Brigalis, who talked about the dentist infecting her. And it was a segment that they would show often. They, you know, they would have like follow-up segments to it. So clearly it was something that got a lot of attention because they want viewers, right? So they're going to show it again later. Cut to, you know, years later, I started to work as an HIV test counselor in the state of Florida. I was certified through the Florida Department of Health to educate and counsel people and test them for HIV. I was the one giving test results. And, and then I moved to Los Angeles where I continued doing the same job at a free clinic. And it was one day at work where a patient came in and that she had seen a dentist and she was really concerned about, you know, she was talking about, she had several risk factors, but she was like, well, what about the dentist? Could I have gotten it from the dentist when the dentist was working in my mouth? And I was like, no, you, you can't get it from the dentist. And, and I explained to her like the ways that HIV is transmitted is through, um, through five fluids. And so anytime we encounter those fluids, we want to be cautious, but through, a dental procedure, there's no way to, it, it's so hard for, to encounter someone's blood or breast milk or, you know, semen. And, and also HIV needs a window into the body. So it's a way of um, entering into the bloodstream. But after she left, I did remember the story on a current affair. I didn't remember any of the names involved. So we started Googling and the question was, how did that dentist give his patients AIDS? And I thought, Maybe it was on purpose. And so I started reading these articles and it was clear how much homophobia just saturated uh, at just every story. And, and also nothing seemed really definitive. So I was just really compelled by this question of, you know, what happened in that dental office? And my research just kind of kept growing. And I think like as creative people, we have an artistic impulse and we just follow it and cognition comes later. I didn't know really what I was doing except following my own kind of curiosity. And, and so during the research, I would write notes in like the margins. I would make lots of copies um, and write notes in the margin. And, and some of those notes are even poems that are directly into the book. Um, yeah, so, I mean, because I remember, um, I remember those shows too, you know, at Korean Affair, all those lurid storylines about strippers and, and whatnot. Um, and my next question for you, though, is why the title A Quilt for David? And um, if you don't mind, if I know to, to read, um, I think the poem is on page five. Yeah, sure. So... Those who are not familiar, the AIDS Memorial Quilt was a way for people to honor loved ones uh, who have passed from AIDS. And, you know, quilting is, is such like a all American kind of thing to create quilts and the AIDS quilt, I, when doing my research, I discovered, oh, someone made a panel for Kimberly. Oh, someone else made a panel for Kimberly. And I soon realized that Kimberly has four panels on the AIDS quilt and David didn't have one. Roy Cohen even has one, but not, but not David. And these poems really kind of felt like patchwork. It's me like grabbing scraps of information and kind of compiling them and putting them together almost like one would with a quilt. And so I don't sew but this was my quilt for David. This was my honoring a man's life. And, you know, a line in the poem I'm about to read, thanks to your nudge, um, is that I wanted people to remember that you died of it too. And so through all of the research and the people I talked to, 
it seems like that was really forgotten about as well. Like this was a man who was equally scared when he received his diagnosis, did not know what was to become of his life. Um, how does one navigate sexual relationships, romantic relationships, family relationships when they're HIV positive? And it's not easy now, and it definitely wasn't easy back then. And um, so that's that's really where the title of this book comes from, and um, I'd be happy to read that poem. <clears throat> I'd sew, I'd sew a quilt for you. I would grab a needle, put the thread in my mouth, moisten the fibers together. I'd pierce into the eye. I'd hem, back sit, back stitch, side stitch. A remembrance of you. I'd put my, I'd put your name in large letters, wanting no one to forget that you died of it too. I'd sew you into that larger quilt because no one else has. I'd select patterns, design a quilt representing your lifelong loves. Kimberly has four panels. I'd sew for you, thimble on my thumb, push the threaded needle through the fabric. If I were to prick my finger and bleed, I wouldn't regret a single drop of blood or effort. So that's one of many uh, really touching and you know beautiful poems in this book. Um, I wanted to say that after I finished, and I read it twice, Stephen, so you know, I did my homework. Um, but the, I would say the main things that I took away from your book were, and I'm gonna have to read from something, the uh, confusion surrounding Kimberly, the Gallus, and the others. There were eight accusers in all. The, uh, the public support that Kimberly and the others got um, versus what I call the monsterization of David. Mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then ultimately, the, uh, the sympathy and the compassion that you show throughout this book to which everybody involved. Um, it's just really, really a powerful book. Um, and then if you, you know, I, and I don't want to bog you down too much with reading, but I do want to add two more poems that I thought <clears throat> really highlight um, the nuanced picture that you paint of these people and so David, you, Stephen, yeah. you could read uh, on page 16 and then also page 21. I, okay. I look at these sure. like bookend poems, so I'll, I'll let you take it away. Okay, thanks. Um, oh, I, I love that you selected these. Um, so they're about uh, typhoid Mary. Mary Malone, an immigrant, David, David Acker, gay. Not popular traits for their times. Her body housed bacteria, his a virus. Typhoid Mary died nine years to the day David was born in Ohio, November 11th, 1949. She, a young cook, didn't stop when she was told of the poison running in her. David asked his doctor, who didn't know his real name, if he could continue. Maybe David, like Mary, infected those he served. Maybe instruments weren't cleaned well enough. Maybe the numb fingertips of neuropathy were pierced or cut accidentally. Maybe it did happen, not to all, but maybe a few. The others wrote it for the money they might not live to enjoy. Typhoid Mary didn't believe when they told her to stop preparing food, to stop practicing her only line of work. She knew nothing of transmission. David didn't stop either, told of necessary precautions, took them. The difference, Mary infected people unknowingly. David might not have infected anyone at all. So, <clears throat> you know, throughout this book, you know, questions are raised uh, on, on many levels. Um, questions about Kimberly Vigalis and the other accusers. Um, and then also questions about David Acker. And I feel like that you really um, try to put a lens through all of this 
where you, um, I guess you find a way to shed light on what happened. And one of the things that I think seems like you found challenging was that there was a lot of material on Kimberly Begalitz. They were just, I mean, I remember this. It was all Kimberly, Kimberly, Kimberly. She testified in Congress. Um, the public sympathy was towards Kimberly and there was very little on David Acker. And what there was was just the media portraying him as this villain, this monster. So I wanted to ask you what the research process was like for this book. You know, what did you find? Where did you go? How did you how did you put this book together? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. One thing before I even answer the question directly, I yeah, there I like that you chose those two poems because it addresses how, you know, Typhoid Mary, David Acker. Um, Miss O'Leary from Chicago with the, the fire in Chicago, all of these individuals who we kind of know their names and they're all outsiders. These are people in the margins. These are people who aren't well regarded, you know, immigrants, gay men, and that creates a vulnerability and that vulnerability is then preyed upon, or it's easy to take advantage of someone's vulnerability when they're of a lesser status. And maybe these accusers didn't have, weren't fully aware of what they were doing at the time when they made their accusations against David. It does, though there's, there's already a machine in place um, in our culture that, that benefits them. You know, that Kimberly said she was a virgin, said she was a virgin. And I think that, you know, right away, there's an archetype, right? Americans love a virgin, you know, that, that there's this archetype of someone being pure and inner, innocent, and she was religious. Yet at the same time, Kimberly, of her own admission, um, smoked pot, um, you know, she gummed cocaine. I don't know if anyone knows that, but like, that's like putting cocaine on your finger and like putting it in your mouth. This is not, a. I mean, I hope she had a lot of fun in her life and I hope she, you know, enjoyed the drugs that she did. But to paint someone as deserving and someone undeserving of the virus. And I think that Kimberly, um, it was not easy being Kimberly Bergalis in her household. I don't think it was easy her being maybe the kind of woman she was becoming and to live with such strict parents. And I think that created a, um, a story. So the research since so much of what was printed was centered around David, it was important for me to talk to people who knew David, to talk to patients, people who David worked with. And I went about, first of all, trying to call numbers I, I could find. And when that didn't yield much, I placed an ad in the newspaper with a photo of David. There was only, at the, at the time, I could only find one public photo of David. And so I, I used that image. And then I said, looking to talk to people who were, you know, friends, coworkers, acquaintances, lovers with David, Ak David Acker. And because of the age and knowing that not everyone is online, especially at the time, this is over 12 years ago, that I not only included my email address, but I included my home phone number <laughs> in the ad. And so my, my phone rang and it rang pretty often. The, and I really enjoyed the conversations I did have with people. What was fascinating are the people who called to give me their opinions, yet they had no connection to the situation. They didn't live, you know, that maybe they lived in the area at the time, which is how they found um, the ad, but they were just calling to give their opinions. They, they had no direct connection. And that to me said something about the public's perception of the situation, that it's fact or also, you know, we, we saw it a lot uh, in recently in the past four years, of people ignoring data, right? Or discrediting science. And what's important is what I believe or what I feel or what I think. Well, feelings aren't facts. So let, let's go back to the facts and, and look at what's happening. I, and, and that's what I did. 
I, I started looking at like, what were the other risk factors of the accusers? And, and how could someone have transmitted? How could a dentist have transmitted? Even a dentist not wearing gloves. How is it transmitted? So yeah, research was, was significantly harder. And, and part of that is because I think a lot of journalists didn't do their job and didn't do adequate research in 1991. And so here I am like picking up any scraps or pieces of information. The CDC, when investigating the situation, they couldn't find any sexual partners of David. And I, you know, close to, you know, 20 years later, I talked to a sexual partner of David's. So, you know, I, on my own with no resources, I, I was able to find and discover people that the CDC wasn't even able to. And then the other question that I have is like, uh, why did, and, you know, you're a poet, but I still have to ask, sorry, Stephen, why poetry? <laughs> yeah, well, for lots of reasons, I think, Poetry is the language of our emotions. And this is a situation that people's belief in Kimberly was an emotional response, Kimberly and the other accusers. So what if I used poetry to do the labor of helping people access their empathy for David? You know, using poetry to help kind of like crack, to, to kind of to elicit emotions from them. And, you know, a lot of times uh, the data is there, the facts are there, but what moves us is um, our emotions. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, reading all these stories, you know, it's just brought up a lot of emotions. And one of the, I think the, it's 2022, um, there's certainly a lot going on in uh, in terms of, you know, gay rights and all that. Like now we have Don't Say Gay. I mean, we're still battling um, homophobia. We're still battling fear. But this book really made me remember how fearful a time it was back in the late 80s and the early 90s and how homophobia was just the norm, you know, it was, it felt to me like homophobia was the norm. And I was surprised at how quickly I had forgotten all that. And it was also, and I shouldn't be surprised, but I was surprised at how much um, Kimberly Bugalis' story just crystallized the nation at that time. And, you know, even, even got like Jesse Helms to try to pass legislation that would make it, if I remember correctly, it was some, um, they were trying to require the healthcare workers disclose their HIV status. Otherwise they would face a 10 year sentence and a $10,000 fine. Um, I was surprised to remember that it actually failed. I mean, thankfully it failed, but, um, I have to wonder, and I know that this is what you tried to do in this book, but why do you think David's family was really quiet about all of this um, when they certainly had opportunities to tell their side of the story? I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, numerous thoughts. One is that to kind of have that bill presented requires more power than the Bergalis family would have had. What they did is they hired a high powered attorney by the name of Robert Montgomery, who uh, very well known in the state of Florida, he's the one who sued and won the tobacco uh, indus uh, industry. And he was the one who, very media savvy and and I think the Acker family was dealing with their grief. So David, three days, I think it was three days before he died, 
he wrote a letter to the newspaper stating that he was the dentist of the accusations. He does not believe he infected anyone. Um, I, I use a quote of his in the introduction of this book. He says, I'm, I'm a gentle man and it would go against everything I believe in to infect or harm someone else. And, and I think, oh, so he dies. The letter is published after his death. And the very next day, Robert Montgomery schedules a press conference with Kimberly Bergalis saying, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, patient A. Which seems, um, why was a press conference needed, right? That, that was a media, that was a spin, um, that was to garner attention and maybe even feed Robert Montgomery's ego that he wanted, you know, a big case. I don't think that, I, I don't know how, if the Acker family would have said anything, if it would have changed the narrative that much. It was already just snowballing um, out of control. The information that was given about David at the time was all, it was always spun into something spurious um, or suspect. At one point in time, one of his colleagues said um, that he had said like, oh, I used to let things worry me and now I let them roll off my back or some comment like that. And that was turned into an article about him being malicious or um, unfeeling towards other people. And how many of us in a casual conversation would say, oh, like, oh, I'm trying to let go of things. And, and so I think in a way it, it probably served them or it was less painful to continue to combat that and fight that. Also, when you mentioned about, you know, yeah, Kimberly Bergalis did uh, talk to Congress and she really, and the Bergalis family really lobbied for this very restrictive um, rule of having HIV positive health workers disclose their status. What's problematic about that is some of the HIV positive healthcare workers out there became HIV positive because they were working in healthcare and from needle sticks, accidental needle sticks. Also, it would affect their livelihood. And so what, what were they supposed to do, disclose to everyone that, that they would encounter in their practice when there's not enough data to kind of support that transmission was happening? And one thing in that, you know, I, I share in the book and only one poem though, is that Kimberly knew her status and went to another dentist after David died. She knew her status before she became public. She went to another dentist and said nothing about her HIV status. It's, and she had a right to uh, not disclose that. Yet at the same time, later on, she's talking to Congress and wanting other people, like healthcare workers to disclose their status. It's complicated. And also, wait, I was also surprised to learn that the lawyer himself had a son who was HIV positive and, and died of AIDS, I think a year after David or Kimberly did. Um, do you know if at any point during this during this time, did the lawyer ever disclose that? So the lawyer, when when Kimberly was alive and he was representing her, he didn't actually. And I only found one mention of Robert Montgomery's son uh, dying of HIV. And I, I almost didn't believe it. And I had to do further research that he, um, you know, I was told that he was a gay man. And it's interesting, right, that we have this Southern lawyer who really advocated for Kimberly Bergalis. And I hope that his gay son who died of AIDS was treated with just as much generosity and care as Robert treated Kimberly. But the reality is, I doubt that that was, that was the case. And it's something I do continually in the book is contrasting the treatment of, of people, right? 
There's another accuser of David Acker, Lisa Shoemaker, who did not lie about her sexual partners or her previous risks and was dragged through the media. And Lisa was less camera ready. Um, she was uh, very sad and depressed about her diagnosis, uh, sought comfort in food. So she was overweight at the time and lived kind of maybe a little bit more of a rebellious life. And so it was almost as if she wasn't believed. Robert Montgomery declined representing her. And, you know, it's so to see like, even how the media treated Lisa Shoemaker, a female, a white female, and how they treated Kimberly Brigalis, another white female, it's, it's really telling of, you know, what risks do we forgive and what risks do we punish? You know, or whose risks do we forgive and whose risks do we punish? Well, it seemed to me that what was going on was um, that the public and the lawyer too, I think, because he kind of cherry picked his clients because um, they were eight accusers and he didn't represent them all, mm -hmm. but he represented and the country fell behind the purest of them all. Can you believe yes. the Alex, the poor grandmother, um, the older woman, and, and of course they uh, trashed um, the woman who whose morals didn't quite hold up to standard or mm -hmm. wasn't quite on the, the straight and narrow. Um, and, you know, as a gay man, I, you know, I can relate, I mean, I don't agree with it, but I can, I can see that happening. Like if you don't fit the right, if you don't check off the right boxes, then, you know, good luck. Wasn't there also like a, a black man that, um, one of the, which one of the eight accusers, a black man? Do I remember that correctly? No, I, I do talk about one man, James Sharp. I, um, if I'm remembering his name correctly, accused his dentist, a different dentist, of infecting him with HIV. And unlike Kimberly, James's history was brought up, um, scrutinized. And, you know, that's another comparison I make in the book. Like, look at how this man was, this Black man was treated versus Kimberly. And, you know, I thought that I was writing and researching about what happened to that dental office. Really, though, I was researching and writing about what happened in our country at that time. And how, you know, it's all there, the, the mistreatment of people living with HIV, of gay men. You, you can tell like classism and racism is also deeply involved. It, it is a sad story, although I also believe it's a very important story to tell and also a very specific one. And by looking at this like thin slice of cake, you know, like we know what the rest of the cake tastes like. Absolutely. Um you know what, in the, the, before we get to the q and I wanted to just kind of um, punctuate this conversation with the fact that I feel like after all of this, you still paint everybody with um, compassion and with, you know, with an understanding that um, everybody was cheated, everybody was, um, robbed, um, nobody got what they wanted. Uh, you know, David Acker didn't get a life filled with love and peace and Kimberly Begalis didn't get justice, the justice that she was looking for and she didn't get the full life that she would deserve to have. Um, so if you don't mind, I have a couple more poems um, unless you have other poems you would rather read, but um, one of them is on page 31 and the other is on page 78. Um, so 31, do you mind? 31 and the other was 78, you said? 
Yeah, 31 in 78. Oh. Kimberly testified to Congress, I did nothing wrong. My life has been taken away. Then in a video de deposition, has anyone ever performed oral sex on you? Yes. Was there more than one episode? Yes. She didn't do anything wrong. She did with that man, with other men, what lovers do. She explored the pleasures of the body. She did what David had done, what Barbara, John, Sherry, Lisa, and Richard had done. They were alive and bright and lovable and sexy, and they shared of themselves, of their bodies, with the Lord, the gym, or genetics had given them, with someone else or many others. Nothing they had done was wrong and the life they knew was taken from them. David wrote, it is my desire to die in private peace and quiet with as much dignity as possible. Kimberly wrote, if laws are not formed to provide protection, then my suffering and death was in vain. Neither received what they wanted. And the last question that I have for you, Stephen, is uh, what happened to David's practice? Oh, David uh, was told, his patients were told that he had cancer. Um, you know, his appearance soon became sickly and his patients were told that he had cancer. It was a way of selling the business without, um, you know, without the rumor of AIDS. Um, because of course he wanted to make a profit off of his business. He wanted to sell it. What was the rest of his life going to look like? How was he going to be able to support his medical treatments? And uh, the furniture was distributed through Dolphin Supply Company. I, I remember the name of the company that bought the furniture. And it, the building then became a nightclub which like only in Florida, right? But I mean, you think like a dental office becomes a nightclub. And then later on it became a casino. And I, uh, my last time when I was on the treasure coast, I, I went to the casino just to kind of like be inside the office and look out the windows that David's patients looked out on. Yeah, so I thought it was like um, a little, you know, like a little ironic that his office became uh, a disco and then a casino. You know, it's like, because all these people, um, you know, they, I actually thought it was ironic that the, uh, the practice became, met like, a, like an ironic end. Um, so I have some questions. We have quite a few questions so i want to see if we can get through them so are you ready yes i'll Actually, answer them quickly and thank you everyone for joining tonight i appreciate it oh sure um we i we actually got a question ahead of time and i wanted to uh read it and and uh get your thoughts on it Stephen. so this is a question from a school librarian for a k to six school in my school district, the librarians have had many conversations about where the line between selecting content that is considered appropriate for its students and selecting content that is inclusive and offers new perspectives or viewpoints. LGBTQ plus titles are very contentious this year, especially in view of book bannings nationwide that claim books relating to LGBTQ plus topics are too sexual in nature. There's a lot of fear from my colleagues about crossing the line. What is your perspective? Would it have mattered if you encountered library books in elementary school about matters relating to the queer community or its members? Would it have mattered if I were in elementary school and encountered those books? Yes, it would have. And it would have made life so much easier and better for myself. I think the isolation that young queer kids or even kids growing up with questioning with questions about themselves, I think that 
it's incredibly painful. I also think that there's a high percentage of childhood victims of sexual assault that identify as LGBTQ. And I think, I don't think that being, and like I myself identify in that way. Um, I think that I'm not gay because I was molested as a kid. I think I was questioning my sexuality and I was feeling isolated from my peers and the people around me and, and I was questioning. And I think that questioning was then preyed upon. I think my vulnerability was preyed upon. So what if we had young queer kids with a sense of self or feeling good about who they are in the world or confident? I think that um, it doesn't, it, it makes that preying upon them harder. I also think what's wonderful about libraries is, is language and how when we read about an experience, we can put language to that experience. So it was only because of I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, my Angelo's memoir, when I read it, not even knowing that I was going to encounter a, a passage about her sexual assault as a young girl, that I was like, it, like everything clicked for me. And I was like, that's what's been happening to me. It's not a coincidence, like that is such a contested book is I know where the cage bird sings. It's still, you know, a, a banned book and that people find dangerous. I think it's important to have those perspectives in terms of the accusation that LGBTQ media is sexualized is an eye roll to me. Um, I, I think that people, uh, especially people who are grappling with homophobia or are very conservative, they, um, they seem to sexualize everything queer people do. That um, some, some like mundane comment or gesture on our part becomes over-sexualized by them. We're not doing that. And um, a handhold from us or a kiss becomes a gross public display of affection. You know, the first time I went to Las Vegas, I, <laughs> I was 30 and I was in Las Vegas. I was so upset looking around. I was like, I can't believe you. Like, do you people judge us? I was so incensed. I was like, you straight people judge us. You're disgusting. You know, like, I just felt like all the things that they accuse us for, like, you'll find on the streets in Vegas. And it's, it's just that example, like, that behavior is so acceptable to them. But when queer people do it, we're judged and demonized. Thank you. I have, um, I think this is a, a great question. What were the conversations like with the people who had known David? Oh, there were numerous ones. Um, one, there were several sweet, sweet ones actually. And, you know, a lot of them made it into the book. One woman said that David used to save her office copies of People Magazine. And, you know, how thoughtful, what a, what a sweet gesture. And it's really kind of ironic and sad that eight months after David died, that he was the cover story on People Magazine and, and Kimberly was photographed for it. Also, he had given theater tickets, um, his theater tickets to an actress um, who was a patient of his when he wasn't using them. His, his theater tickets, he would give them to her. I also um, met a, a woman who, I'm tempted to give her name as a shout out, but I'm, I'm going to not, that she was best friends with one of David's ex-boyfriends who unfortunately died of AIDS as well. Although she told a story about how she was volunteering with a, you know, like at, at risk youth. Um, I think, and if I'm remembering, I think the, the young kids were 
orphaned. I'm not sure that's the case though. And, and David offered to take all of them out on his boat, boating for a day and, and to teach them like water skiing. So those are really some of the sweet stories that I heard. I actually didn't hear any horror stories. There was nothing that gave me concern or alarm um, from the personal stories that I heard. And then another question is, so if insurance paid out, did they do so without naming David at fault? If not, was he ever absolved? Did you know? No, um, I, I think it was one of those situations that, you know, the, it was easier for the insurance, it was cheaper for the insurance company to pay out as opposed to take it to court. I also imagine, um, with the media at the time and the hysteria, the HIV hysteria, I, I imagine they didn't think that it would go over well. And what, what would be the use of it, of contesting it? Do you, know if the, I, do you know if the payout was before he died or after? It was after he died. The, the biggest payout came from his malpractice and the biggest payout that is documented is from his, insurance malpractice. So he had $3 million of malpractice insurance and very close to 1 million went to Kimberly Bergalis. 1 million went to one of the male accusers. And then I also think Barbara Webb. I can't remember which male, male accuser. A um, million dollars. And then they also sued the insurance company that referred them to David. So there were two different payouts for the accusers. And then um, I have some another question. I love hearing about your research project in choice of genre. Was there an initial event or moment that led you to the realization that you had to tell this story? What was it that that sparked your inspiration? Was there any one moment? Oh. oh that's, was there any one moment? You studied this book like 10 years ago or so, is that right? Yeah, it was actually, you know, in doing press for the book, I always say 10 years, but actually, it's, I think it's more like 13. <laughs> that, you know, I just say 10, I think maybe it sounds poetic or something, but it's actually, it was 13 years. And I don't know the moment that I thought like, I have to complete this book. What I do know is what happened to David could happen to any of us, where someone points a finger and it changes our legacy, it changes our life, where an accusation can, can throw, you know, what people know of us, um, you know, it, it just, it, it can change. It also is a terrible story about secrets and everyone involved had a secret. And unfortunately, David's secrets um, combined with people's misperceptions about queer people um, and homophobia, like it, it didn't work in his favor. And, and part of it is that thing of, you know, I went to the bat for him. You know, I worked so hard on this. And if anything would ever befall me, whether I'm living or after I'm dead, I'm in hope someone would take the time and research. I mean, this is an incredible act of love on my part for someone I didn't know. But I think part of it is just how, how are we treating other people and this thing about seeing something that's unjust and addressing it. Um, so I think maybe that was kind of the motivation that if this, you know, if David, you know, also that it just felt right, this is the right thing to do, to, to have this information and not say anything and not try to be public. And it's one thing I love about this book getting attention is that it's, I mean, it's very nice to hear the praise about my, the actual work. I like that. It's also really nice that so many people are encountering David Acker's name, that so many people are given an opportunity just to kind of like, 
it's changing their perspective about this situation. The Wikipedia article about Kimberly Regalis, still, it doesn't reflect these changes. Um, the New York Times, like, hasn't written about this. The LA Times hasn't written about this. The papers in Florida haven't written about the new information. So it is, you know, kind of combating an old narrative that um, seems to be dying, you know. Yeah, because David um, n never really got a chance to tell his side of the story and he didn't want to. So this was your attempt at, you know, um, I don't know, if not correcting the narrative, at least balancing it a little bit. Yeah. So another question that we have is, um, is if you can explain why some of the, uh, some of the book is in like prose. Sure. Some of it is in poetry. I, I'm curious about that as well. Yeah. There, there wasn't really a hard and fast rule. Sometimes it just worked better. You know, the, the prose is almost like reportage. You know, just kind of um, almost like one might read like a newspaper story or a quick quote. Also, some of them line breaks. It just didn't add. It just didn't add to the material. There wasn't a need for a line break. And others, it it just felt more appropriate. It was really just kind of a feel for for me on most of them. Thank you. And I have one last question and. I want to know the answer to this one too. And it's that, Stephen, what is on the wall behind you? It's giving you big <laughs> yellow energy and it's fantastic. <laughs> yes, it's a piece of artwork. I'm actually, um, I don't know the artist's name. Um, I'm house sitting right now and staying at a friend's house. And I was trying to think of like, what's a great background? Um, I can't see the artist's name. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't read the name, but um, I thought it would be a great colorful background for this. And it is, it is. Um, I want to give you a chance, um, you know, what are your future plans? Um, anything you want to share with us, social media, et cetera? Yeah, the greatest way to find out what I'm doing is through my website, which is stephenrains.com. I'm also on almost every social media platform under my name. So Instagram, it's stephenrains.com. I'm sorry. Instagram at Stephen Rains, and then Twitter and Facebook. It's both um, Stephen Rains. I have a question, real quick. I'm going to sneak in here. Um, what are you reading right now, and what what do you think people should be reading right now? Oh, what am I reading right now? I just picked it up, and it's a book of essays on Georgia O'Keeffe. <laughs> oh, that's um, pretty cool. Yeah. And I just read, but what I finished was a book called Weekends with O'Keefe. And it, it's a young poet where she, well, spent weekends with Georgia O'Keeffe. And she would spend the time with her and every evening she would write in her journal about what took place. And it's a lot of reporting about like the food that she cooked for Georgia or conversations that they would have. and. I just thought that's kind of interesting that kind of, um, you know, that, you know, that encounter of like touching stars, right? Like this is our most well-known, I mean, one of our most famous and well-known female American painters and just kind of that inside glimpse. And so I think that's, I just, and it, it was, it was a good book. It was, I just found myself still kind of hungry for more information. So this book of essays, that is about um, people's personal experiences or just people with Georgia O'Keeffe or just writing about her. Um, and, and once again, you know, that's my, I, I don't know why I'm doing that. Um, I'm just doing it because I have an interest in, well, I have an interest in Georgia O'Keeffe. And so I'm just going to follow that and it doesn't have to lead anywhere or maybe it will lead to a change that's going to affect the rest of my life. I don't know. And I think that's what I would say in terms of other people that, you know, what they should be reading right now is what really is what you're drawn to and not focus on um, what's going to make charming dinner, dinner party conversations or what's really in vogue to read 
I think just follow your interests. And what's so great is how diverse the library is and that it's so democratic in that way that any interest that you have just to kind of like pursue it and just keep going. And I think it's how we shape our lives and our perspectives. That kind of segues into the final question. And I promise this is the last one and then we'll let you go, Stephen. Um, given that it's queer poetry program and it's poetry month, the last question we have is what advice do you have for future poets interested in research or science-based poetry? So this was a fantastic way of um, addressing a topic. Yeah. Wait, advice I have for poets, or advice for poets or people who are advice looking to read poetry? Advice for future poets interested in research or science-based poetry. Kind of like narrative poetry, I would say. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Do I actually have advice, though? Um, I would say, oof, this is going to sound harsh. Um, I teach a lot of writing workshops. And when people share their work, I can almost tell right away when I hear their work, whether they read poetry or not. And it's something that the more we consume poetry, it, it's like it, it, um, it refines your palate. And, and so I, I would say the first thing is just, is just to consume it. Um, very similar to, you know, like in the kitchen, if um, you're trying to make something, let's say you're trying to make crepes, it's really helpful to eat different crepes first. You know, it, it like, it, it affects like our output. Um, so I would say that's the first thing is, is just to read and read what you enjoy. And also if you're reading something and not enjoying it, I think a good question is, why are you not enjoying it? What is the poet doing that's not resonating for you? What is amiss? And, and you learn from that too. So I would say that's the first bit of advice. Um, I think that, yeah, I hope that was it. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you everybody for joining us. Um, and thank you, Stephen, for a quote for David and for giving us an hour of your time to poke your brain and, and uh, gain some insight to your research project and your efforts at addressing this inequity. So thank you, Stephen, and thank you everybody for joining us. Good night. Uh, thank you so much, David, for having me. Thank you everyone for joining. And um, I, I loved this evening. So thank you so much, I appreciate it. Well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, check out the library, lacountylibrary.org and uh, check out our pride page, lacountylibrary.org slash pride for upcoming programs. And thank you again, Stephen, and thank you, David, and see you all soon. All right, thanks. And David, can we take a photo together before we go? <laughs>